So I want this YouTube channel and my site really to be a resource for you that you can come and you can learn about abuse and trauma and resources for getting through those things, things like that. But I know that part of the point of being on YouTube, part of the point of video is so that you can connect with me. And so I've done a lot of informational videos up until this point with little bits of me thrown in there. And so this week we're gonna to try to do something a little bit different. We're gonna talk a little bit about my experience with trauma. I could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> and I have a tendency to make these videos too long already. Maybe. So we'll see how this goes. So the definition, the dictionary definition of trauma is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. The helpguide.org says that emotional and psychological trauma is the result of extraordinarily stressful events that shatter your sense of security, making you feel helpless in a dangerous world. I would agree. I mean, trauma is a big deal because it changes your perspective of reality. That's what trauma is in my mind. You can go on living your life before trauma, believing that you're relatively safe and things are secure. I was thinking about like riding in cars. You can go on about your life safely getting from point A to point B hundreds or thousands of times in your life. And then you get into a massive car accident and you may not, uh, not be able to get back into a car, at least not for a long time because the belief system that you had around the idea that you could ride in a car and that would be safe has been shattered. Now the reality is it was always dangerous to ride in a car. It's part of a broken, faltered, sin-filled world where bad things happen. But your experience of it hadn't been dangerous yet. And you might have even known intellectually that it was possible that you were going to get into a car accident. You put your seatbelt on because you know that it's possible that you could be in an accident. But there's a world of difference between knowing something intellectually and experiencing it for yourself. So, trauma. I'm personally what's called a complex trauma patient. Or I don't know what you call it if you're not a patient anymore. I'm not in therapy right now. I'm going to start therapy again, though, in a few weeks. But I'd be referred to as a complex trauma patient. It just means that I have had trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. So you might even have somebody who's had a relatively untraumatic life and they are raped one time. Or they have the death of somebody that was really close to them unexpectedly, that one trauma can be enough to really mess up somebody's world. I, uh, I don't remember what one trauma is like. So I can't teach you from that perspective. I can teach you what that's like. Like, I, I know the research. I can tell you about what the things that you're going to go through are. And things like that. But as far as perspective goes, I haven't been able to do that in a long time. And I didn't realize how messed up my perspective was until one time in therapy. So it's been several years ago now. We were talking about somebody else in my life. And I mentioned that they had only been raped once. Like, they were only raped once. It's not that big of a deal. And my counselor was like, yeah, April. It is a big deal. And I know it's a big deal. I know it. I knew it then. But I was so far removed from the idea that that was a big thing. Because it had happened to me so many times. That I couldn't even remember really what it was like to have had it one time. I couldn't remember the trauma that happened as the result of that. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. You can put a like or something in the comments if it makes sense. I would appreciate it. I have notes. I always try to do some kind of an outline. This time I put more notes 
<laughs> in an effort to try to not let me talk a ton, but it's going to happen. So I thought that we would go over symptoms of psychological trauma, and then I can talk about ones that I can relate to. Because everybody, you know, everybody experiences trauma a little bit differently. So that's something to note too. Like, you shouldn't judge yourself or other people for the way that you go through trauma, the way you process trauma, because there isn't a right or wrong way to process it or to go through it. Don't be so hard on yourself. So there's different types of symptoms, emotional and psychological symptoms, mental health th symptoms, hmm. symptoms, shock, denial, disbelief, confusion, difficulty concentrating, anger, irritability, mood swings, fear and anxiety, guilt, shame, self-blame, withdrawing from others, feeling sad or hopeless, feeling disconnected or numb. Shock, denial, disbelief. I think everybody goes through that to some extent or another. I can tell you that it's very common for people who experience trauma to try to act like it never happened. Like that's something that's been very common I've noticed when I'm working with people who have experienced some kind of a sexual assault, sexual abuse, rape, etc. All the things that fall into that. Their initial response very, very frequently is to try to act like it didn't happen. I just want to go on with my life. I just want to act like it didn't happen. One might call that shock and denial. And I think of it like, you know, if you are in a car accident and your leg snaps in the car accident, you had this adrenaline going and you can go into shock. And so you might not even feel that leg at first because your body knows that you can only handle so much. And so right now, that's more than you can handle. So it will allow you to not feel it for a little bit. Eventually, the shock wears off and you're definitely going to feel it. And I think that is what that desire to not acknowledge it, to act like it never happened, and to just make it go away. I think that that's a type of shock for you emotionally. You just, you're not ready to handle all that having that type of trauma is going to produce in you. But eventually, you're going to have to feel it. Eventually, it's going to be in your face, demanding acknowledgement, whether you want to or not. Confusion, difficulty concentrating. I was thinking about this because I've done a lot of uh, psychology stuff. I majored in psychology in college, and there is like one prevailing question in psychology Super profound. Are you ready? What came first, the chicken or the egg? That is the unanswerable question in psychology. It's deep, important stuff. But the, re <laughs> uh, but the point of it is, what influenced this? Is it genetics or is it experience and surroundings and social influence. What caused this? So I'm pretty sure that I would be classified as ADHD. And I don't think that's a bad thing. But one could question, does she have difficulty concentrating because she has ADHD? Or does she have ADHD and difficulty concentrating and sitting still because she has experienced trauma? And it's a trauma response. One may never know. And I could spend a lot of time pondering such things, but I really don't care. It doesn't matter why it's there. It's just there. And so that's just me. Anger, irritability, mood swings. Oh, man. I have a lot to say there, too. But there's a term called PTSD rage where you just flip. That's the basic gist of it. You can go from being completely calm to blah, Satan in a half of a second. It's a trauma response. It's part of PTSD. It's definitely something that I have experienced. And, you know, the people that are closest to you are going to see this the most. Any of these things. And as somebody who works with youth, I get to see 
so much damage that happens to the next generation because the generation above, which right now is my generation, did not deal with their own crap. And they take it out on or pass it down to their kids. If you have experienced trauma, you need to deal with it. I do not have the rage that I used to. I've learned how to manage my emotions better. I've learned tools for calming down when I need to, or walking away, or different things, but you don't have those until you've been taught those. So either get into counseling and learn from somebody, or there are counselors on YouTube you can watch, and they will teach you things. I would like to do some collaborating with them eventually or highlighting them or something because there are some of them that are good. But you need to learn to deal with these things. Anger and rage being one of them. My trauma counselor explained to me that people who've experienced trauma tend to be higher on the scale of irritability. Is that it? There's a scale, we'll say like 1 to 10. 1 being completely calm. 10 being like enraged. Normally people set at like a four or five. That's like a normal range. When you've experienced trauma, you ride more like a seven. So when a four or a five gets upset, it might take them to a six or a seven. When a seven gets upset, somebody who's experienced trauma, it might take them to a 10 easily. And it's the same amount of difference. You go from being calm to being angry. But your bar is already higher in the first place. Not bar. Bar is not the right word. Where you naturally sit all the time, you're resting, so to speak, is already higher in the first place. So you go to psychotic really easy. There's a song I really like. I can't remember who sings it right now. It's called Heathens. And it's one of those that my kids are surprised that I like. But I feel like it describes us well. It sings about how you know, messed up people can smell other really messed up people. And how it's dangerous for you to be around us unless you're a messed up person. And, and it talks about you have to check your weapons at the gate to be able to get in but that doesn't mean you're not still armed because you can explode and I think of that scale when I listen to that song I completely think of that scale you think of people that lose their crap and just they don't even have to have weapons they are a weapon that's people who've experienced trauma can be like that and I referenced that in my book therefore people who've experienced trauma are more dangerous I believe, you know, not that they're always dangerous and they're always scary people. I'm not generally a scary person. Trust me, <laughs> if you knew me, definitely not a scary person. But you mess with my kids, you better believe I can get there. You know, maybe more so than some other people. <laughs> right, a guy who scorned me in the past, he completely was a jerk to me on purpose. And I was like, hmm, I know what the law will and will not do. <laughs> I have been the victim, and I am well aware of all those loopholes. I know what I can get away with, because other people have gotten away with it with me. I would not be the person to screw with. That's a result of my trauma and my experience. Is that a norm? No, but it's a possibility. Anxiety and fear. Yeah, in the short version, a huge portion of my life has spent it has been spent in fear, unfortunately. Anxiety-wise, I've used anti-anxiety medications before on like an as-needed basis, not on a consistent basis, but even on an as-needed basis. Oh, so helpful when I was dealing with stuff. The last time that I got a prescription for as needed was eight years ago now. So I don't use it a lot. I, pr 
probably could use it more, but I kind of baby them because they're like my last resort kind of thing. When I got that refill, it was when we were going to court for my daughter and um, her trauma with my ex-husband. That whole experience was a lot for me in addition to other stuff that was going on. And I was like, I just need some help. I, I just, I can't do all of this by myself. So at that time I was in trauma therapy and I was using anti-anxiety sometimes. I've known other people that need to be on anti-anxiety or anti-depression, anti-anxiety meds consistently. You know, I'm a proponent for using healthy things to get by. Not abusing drugs, but guilt, shame, self-blame. This probably is my gaping wound. This is what I deal with the most. I, I'm one of those personalities where I will put everything on myself. And I feel like personalities like that tend to get victimized more often anyway. Because we want everybody to be okay. We want everybody to be happy. And we don't use our defenses the way that we should because we're too busy caring about everybody else. And so then in turn, we feel shame that we didn't see things or self-blame because everything's our fault. I have a friend who apologizes for breathing. <laughs> Basically, she apologizes for everything. And I am always like, man, I see myself in you so much. You are now where I was a few years ago. I'm not near as apologetic now as I used to be. I still I still struggle with guilt and shame and self-blame, but it does get better. It can get better. So that's good. Um, withdrawing from others. I feel like that's a very natural thing to do when you've experienced trauma. Just like when you run into the corner of a cabinet, we'll say, or something. And so then you hit your arm on the corner of the cabinet, then your natural reflex is, ow! It's to protect, right? Same thing is true emotionally. Withdrawing, protecting. Ah, I've been wounded. I don't want to be vulnerable to other people. The crappy thing in that is that the uh, being vulnerable to other people, the weapon that can be used against you is also the medicine. Sorry to break that to you, but withdrawing from others for a moment to collect yourself is one thing. But you don't want to stay there. Obviously a moment doesn't have to be super, super short, but you don't want to stay there. Because then that'll get into depression. And if you struggle with guilt, shame, self-blame, you don't have anybody there to tell you that's not, a, it's not rational. You're not being rational, April. It is literally not possible for you to be at fault for the entire world. <laughs> you know, sometimes, a lot of times, Probably we need we need other people to be logical when we're in the middle of this ball of emotions We can't be both That's all right. So don't stay there uh, Feeling sad or hopeless Hopelessness I feel like is is a big thing with trauma also because You felt like the world was safe before or you were secure Bad things might happen out there to other people, but they don't happen in your life not that bad right that's the like structure of of what happens and then trauma sort of like the wrecking ball becomes in and destroys that belief system of security and so I feel like hopelessness is kind of a natural thing at first also like a knee-jerk reaction well if I'm not safe and I don't have the security What's the point? <laughs> There's no hope. And that's not true at all. And feeling numb or disconnected, dissociation is a big thing. It was a big thing for me. It's a big thing for a lot of trauma people where you just detach. And that numb feeling, I think, is where a lot of people get into like self-mutilation in different ways because they just want to feel something because they have completely cut themselves off and not allow themselves to feel anything because they're afraid if they feel anything, then they have to feel everything and they don't want to do that. It hurts too much. And I definitely went through that too. I mean, I dealt with some self-harm 
when I was younger, people could argue that I still do self-harm because I keep myself so busy. And it just comes through different outlets now. And I don't, working a lot is definitely my coping mechanism so that I don't have to deal with emotions and stuff. But that's it for me and the emotional psychological symptoms in this list. Physical symptoms, on the other hand, can include insomnia or nightmares, fatigue, being easily startled, difficulty concentrating, racing heartbeat, edginess and agitation, aches and pains, and muscle tension. That's a list that are given in this article. I feel like I've probably had bouts of insomnia, but I work so much that that's not usually an issue for me. Nightmares, however, I have a lot of nightmares. And my nightmares are not, it's not like I'm reliving the experience. My nightmares normally have a lot more to do with, well, when I was going through a lot of trauma in that moment, a lot of blood and a lot of knives were involved, things like that. Snakes tend to be a reoccurring thing for my dreams too, but not so much flashback dreams, but other nightmares, other, other you know, chasing dreams and things where you feel like you are out of control. Fatigue, definitely. When you're dealing with trauma, like it talks about racing heartbeat, um, edginess, agitation. Another thing is hypervigilance, meaning you are paying attention to everything and you're thinking about the worst possible scenarios that could happen at any given moment based on this and based on this and based on this and based on that. And that takes a lot of energy. It is exhausting to be that emotional or to be thinking that much or to be afraid that much. So fatigue for sure. Being easily startled. I'm still easily startled, but not near as much as I was when I was really in the throngs of PTSD. I feel like that's a, a pretty good indicator with PTSD. You jump at everything. You're constantly expecting to get attacked. And that's a crappy place to be. But I've definitely done my time. Difficulty concentrating, we already talked about. Raising heartbeat. I feel like that just goes back to that hyper vigilance. You're just, you're on edge. You're in, I'm ready for fight or flight at any moment. Also, your adrenaline is rushing. Also, another caveat to that is that there's a good chance you're going to gain weight because those stress hormones are not good for you. As a complex trauma person, I have had adrenaline running through me and cortisol, cortisol? It's cortisol, running through me all the time for years. Like I'm able to calm down and, and back off a little bit now than what I was for a long time. I never came down. Calm was not my thing ever. Edginess and agitation, like I said, your PTSD rage or everything in between. Muscle aches and pains. Different people, it seems like, carry their tension in different ways. Their stress in their body in different ways. And I find that interesting to learn about. This is where mine is. I know somebody else who carries theirs in their lower back a lot, as well as up here. Years ago, I had a nurse look at my neck and how solid it was. And she was like, I don't know how you're not unconscious <laughs> because I was like this all the time and that was a long time ago that was a lot of trauma ago I was already that bad way back then but that was already I was already a complex trauma person at that point too and then muscle tension which gives you the aches and pains like tips for taking care of yourself when you've experienced trauma taking care of the basics. That's what I'm calling it. But taking care of your health, making sure that you're getting sleep, making sure that you're eating okay, making sure that you are bathing and things like that, and avoiding drugs and alcohol, avoid extra stress if you know something's going to be stressful. You know, if you're already in the depths of dealing with trauma and you know that going to 
Thanksgiving dinner with your crazy uncle Harry who drinks a ton and screams a lot and gets violent is going to be an issue for you, don't go. It's okay for you to say no. That's something that I didn't know before. I did not own the amount of decision-making capacity that you have in your own life. I thought, well, it's a family thing, so I have to go. I don't have a crazy Uncle Harry. But families can be stressful. <laughs> Depending on the dynamics, they can be really stressful. And that's just an example. There are lots of others. But take care of yourself. It's okay to take breaks. If you're a single parent, you need to be taking care of yourself some too. When I was earlier in my single parenthood, I felt so guilty for taking care of myself. I felt like a terrible parent because my mind was not right. I now know that you're a terrible parent. If you don't take care of yourself, you will end up being a terrible parent. Not that it makes you a terrible parent, but if you don't take care of you, it's kind of like the planes and the oxygen mask thing. If you don't take care of you, how are you going to take care of them? You're going to be a wreck. You're not going to be able to provide for them the kind of life that you want. You're not going to be able to model for them taking care of yourself. They're going to grow up thinking they can't take care of themselves either because my mom, mom never did it. That got me. Like, I don't want my kids to grow up believing that it's wrong for them to take care of themselves. And I can tell them, take care of yourself. But more is caught than taught. They watch what you do. So if you don't take care of yourself, they're not likely to take care of themselves. So those things are important. Thanks for watching. I'll do my part to keep you safe by continuing to put out weekly videos about all things related to intimate partner violence. If you haven't already, please do your part by subscribing to this channel and hitting the notification button so that you don't miss a single video. Bonus points if you share videos with people that you believe will benefit from the information. Until I see you again, stay safe.